This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. The purported use of the Bible to kill people, to cause widespread massacre of innocent civilians cannot be tolerated under any law on earth. That's Kenyan Interior Cabinet Secretary Kituru Kindiki on nearly 90 people who starved themselves to death after allegedly being told by their minister that it would get them to heaven. Details coming up. Also, U.S. President Joe Biden will seek re-election. And at least 57 bodies have washed ashore after two migrant boats sank off Libya. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. While a three-day truce raises hopes for peace, some military analysts say Sudan's violent power struggle between the paramilitary rapid support forces, RSF, could drag in for months or years. Over time, some experts say the Sudanese army is likely to gain the upper hand thanks to its aerial advantage and the logistical support it receives from Egypt, but not a decisive victory. However, the RSF will have enough regional help, mostly from the United Arab Emirates, to survive and fight on. Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, discussed the prospects of a prolonged conflict in Sudan with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shenawi. It is very questionable whether the current ceasefire, which was brokered by the United States and by Saudi Arabia, will lead to a lasting end of the fighting, if the fighting is resumed. The rapid support force does neither have the manpower, nor the equipment, nor the weapons to defeat the Sudanese army, which has, as you've mentioned, a quite capable air force, including about 70 fighter jets from Russia and from China and also about 40 Russian attack helicopters. On the other side, Sudan is a huge country, and the Sudanese army is needed in several hotspots, not only to fight the rapid support force. I doubt that they have altogether the capability to decisively defeat the RSF. They were not able to do so with the various much less powerful insurgencies in the last years in Darfur, in southern Kordofan, and in the Blue Nile area, let alone with South Sudan in the years before. So, I don't see any compelling reason why they should achieve a decisive victory against the much better trained and funded rapid support force. Military analysts believe the battle for Sudan's capital Khartoum is expected to be long and bloody, but the army could capture the city since it has a larger military arsenal in the city. However, They said the RFS eventually would retreat to its stronghold in western province of Darfur, as well as infiltrate and capture small pockets of land elsewhere in Sudan. Would such a trajectory threaten to fracture the country as well as splinter the very forces fighting each other? Yes, absolutely. The Sudanese army won't be able to follow the RSF and defeat them in the stronghold in the southern half of Darfur. And even if the army cooperates with the various former Darfur rebel groups, like the Sudan Liberation Movement Army, the SLMA, and the CHEM, the Justice and Equality Movement, they would not be able to defeat them. Furthermore, the rapid support force, which recruits mainly from Sudanese Arab tribes, will certainly be able to sustain a guerrilla war in other parts of the country, with the support of some fellow tribesmen. They would also probably try to undermine the cohesion of the Sudanese army using the tribal links. One very dangerous military option for them could be to cut off the pipeline from the western oil fields to Khartoum and further on to Port Sudan. So all this could very well lead to a de facto division of the country. The conflict risks getting more interwoven with regional rivalries and power struggles. So if the conflict tilts against one side, then we should expect that friends would come to aid the losing side. Could a protracted war predicted in Sudan threaten outside intervention? I would not rule this out, especially if Egypt considers its own vital interests are in danger. This could be, for example, the case if the RSF is somehow able to threaten Egypt's water supply through the Nile River. Ethiopia could use the weakness of the government in Khartoum to seize the disputed al Fashaga border triangle in the south, which has seen some border clashes from 2020 to 2022, so pretty just a few years behind. I don't think 
it is very likely that the foreign nation would intervene to rescue the RSF, the former Janjaweed, although they control important gold mines in southern Dufour. The RSF and the Janjaweed have a very bad reputation because of their war crimes in the Darfur conflict and also because of their more recent violent crackdown on civilian protesters in Khartoum in 2019. On the other side, it is unlikely that they will be able to take over the whole country, so no one needs to come to rescue the central government. And with regard to the Emirates, regardless of their previous ties, I don't expect them to provide significant military support to the RSF, as this would not only be technically difficult, but also certainly annoy Egypt and probably also also some other countries. I would say there is not much to win in providing such a military support to the former Janjaweed. That was Wolfgang Porstai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El Shenawi. In Sudan, a shaky ceasefire has allowed a group of South Africans previously trapped in Khartoum to leave the country. The rescue mission was coordinated by Gift of the Givers, a South African aid organization. But the group says shooting still resounds across the capital and about 30 South Africans remain unaccounted for. Darren Taylor reports. Gift of the Givers director Imtiaz Suleiman says his staff in Sudan hired buses in Khartoum to take people to Egypt. In fact, we had many more buses than two and the company had arranged it. Unfortunately, they got struck by shells and 17 of the buses got totally destroyed. But we managed to get two buses and they've left. There's 45 people on the two buses, 38 are South Africans and seven are Angolans. The Angolans and Zimbabweans have called on our government to try and assist, get the nationals out. But only seven arrived so many people left this morning. Suleiman called the journey out of Khartoum nerve-wracking. It is indeed very difficult because you don't know what's in front of you. You don't know what's on the side of you. You don't know what's behind you. You're not sure if the different groups are going to stop you. Secondly, the networks keep coming and going. So you can't get information to your own people in time. There's no enough drivers. There's not enough cars. Movement is difficult. And last night at 12 o'clock, when we're supposed to send out the important message, the entire network failed. So some people actually missed the bus. Pearl Mkosi, a South African teacher in Khartoum, made sure she didn't miss the bus, although she says that in itself was a horrific experience. It's really bad out there. The RSF are really like violent. They ask for our passports and everything, but we didn't have our passports because our passport was taken by our schools. So they could process our exit visa because we're supposed to leave on the 7th of May for the summer holidays as we all educators. Across the Nile River near Khartoum, South African Pierre Rousseau remains in Omdurman. He moved to Sudan almost a year ago to establish a beef processing company. The heaviest fighting has been in Khartoum, but there have been a number of clashes in our area because the National TV Broadcast Centre is in Omdurman and there's been a battle to take over that. Rousseau says he's in contact with South African government officials and is optimistic he'll leave Sudan soon. He hopes so, because he's not sure how long his food will last, especially because he's sharing it with fellow trapped expats. Well, I guess it depends on how hungry I get, but, uh, you know, I think we, we're in a fortunate position that we actually still have some food left. We personally are still okay for a couple of days, but people around us aren't. Suleiman says he's trying to keep in contact with his rescue operatives in Khartoum and they hope to locate as many Southern Africans as possible in the days to come. When the team members or the South Africans were moving from different parts of the city to different areas, the one guy said, look, it's the most horrific thing he's ever been through. He said getting out was a nightmare. You just see bodies all over. It's not only military and the RSF, it's bodies of people, of civilians, all over lying in the streets. The French embassy in Pretoria says three South Africans left Khartoum yesterday on a French military helicopter and are now in neighboring Djibouti. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. 
With a video posted on social media early today, U.S. President Joe Biden officially kicked off his bid for re-election. The 80-year-old president said he wants to finish the job he started when the country was in the throes of a deadly pandemic, a troubled economy, and a democracy under threat. 2022 and 2023 polls show more than half of the country's Democrats do not want to see Biden run again. Washington Post White House reporter Tyler Pager tells VOA's Carol Van Dam voters worry about the president's age. He's already the oldest president in American history. And if he were to be reelected at the end of his second term, he would be 86. I think that gives a lot of people pause about the ability for someone who's in their 80s to do the job of American president. Former President Donald Trump is the obvious GOP frontrunner right now. Is this campaign, do you think, going to be basically a reboot of four years ago? It seems that we're headed in that direction. Obviously, it's too early to tell exactly who will clinch the Republican nomination, but Donald Trump continues to lead in all polls and seemingly doesn't have someone that can break into his ironclad grasp over much of the Republican base. And so it looks like we're headed for a rematch, albeit under very dis- different circumstances. In 2020, the coronavirus pandemic really dominated the campaign uh, and a lot of the in-person campaigning we're used to, we did not see. That'll be obviously different in 2024. Biden has not run a robust campaign in years due to, in large part, to that pandemic. You know, he couldn't get out there in front of cameras and make personal appearances. At age 80, how do you think the 2024 campaign will play out? I mean, that is a great question. I think that's what we're all waiting to see. I mean, as president, he travels routinely. I was just in Minnesota with him in North Carolina, obviously in Ireland. I'm heading next month to Japan and Australia with the president. So he does have a robust and busy travel schedule. But there's nothing like a presidential campaign and the grueling nature of it, especially balancing doing that while also serving as president. Um, So we'll see how much he is actually out there. I don't think in the next few months he's going to be doing a whole lot of campaigning. There's uh, major issues he has to reckon with as president from uh, some international travel to the debt ceiling negotiations. But we do expect he will have to campaign in a robust manner, uh, though this time he will have the trappings of Air Force One to make that a little bit easier. You've traveled already extensively with him and you've seen him up close and personal. Does it seem like he has the physical capacity and the mental capacity to do this? Yeah, there's no signs that we've seen, and I'm not a medical expert in uh, assessing him from from that perspective. But uh, you know, we've had conversations with with medical professionals who who know the president and and, and lawmakers and aides who work with him, and they say there's no signs of of decline there. Um, but I, you know, I'm not with the president every day, and but he does have, uh, I can attest, a, a robust travel schedule, and he is frequently on the road, whether domestically or abroad. And Trump is, what, only four years younger than Biden? Right. I think that's one of the things that they make clear uh, that when, you know, we look at a rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden age, uh, Democrats feel is less of a factor given the close proximity that they are to one another. Now, if you look at some of the other candidates running for president, that age uh, uh, gap is, is much larger. And so that is a potential challenge for the president and his team. That's Tyler Pager, White House reporter for The Washington Post. He was speaking to my colleague, Carol Van Dam. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. At least 57 bodies washed ashore today after two migrant boats sank in the Mediterranean off western Libya. One survivor, Bassam Mahmoud from Egypt, told Reuters about 80 passengers were on the boat that set off to Europe. There was an argument as the boat was sinking, but the man in charge refused to stop, he said. Eleven bodies, including that of a child, were recovered of the Karabuli in eastern Tripoli. The migrants were from Pakistan, Syria, Tunisia, and Egypt. A Red Crescent aid worker in Sabarta in western Tripoli told Reuters they have recovered 46 bodies in the past six days from the beach and all were, were illegal migrants from one boat. Reuters reports the International Organization for Migration said 441 migrants and refugees drowned in early 2023 while trying to cross the Mediterranean from North Africa to Europe, the most deaths in the past six years over a three-month period. 
Kenyan authorities exhumed 16 more bodies Tuesday, bringing to, to the death toll at the Good News International Church to 89. But the number of victims is expected to rise as investigators search for more bodies in a forest along the coast. The government has promised to take stern action against the leader of the cult and those who promoted his teachings. Mohammed Yusuf reports from Nairobi. Kenyan authorities continue to recover the bodies of people who, following the teachings of Pastor Paul Mackenzie, starved themselves to death in the hope of meeting their creator. The deaths of the Good News International Church followers have caught the attention of top government officials, including President William Ruto. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kithure Kindiki paid a visit Tuesday to Shakahola Forest, where Mackenzie's followers were buried in shallow graves. This is a clear example of misuse of the fundamental right to the freedom of worship and of religion, which is guaranteed by the constitution of our country and the laws of our country. The purported use of the Bible to kill people, to cause widespread massacre of innocent civilians cannot be tolerated under any law on earth. Kenyan authorities arrested Mackenzie last week and remains detained in the coastal town of Malindi. No charges have been filed thus far as authorities seek more time to complete their investigation. Kenyan officials and some followers say Mackenzie has radicalized his followers in Kalefi County for years. Vera Kazungu, a community worker in Kalifi County, began reporting Mackenzie's activities to authorities in 2018, particularly when children refused to attend school, but says the so-called pastor continued to open more places of worship and recruit more people. We raised the issue, the children's department came in, but at the end of the day, uh, his church was locked down. His church was in Malindi, it was locked down. He went and uh, opened other stations in still in Malindi sub county. One of the church uh, was raised down by fire by the community members. Then he fled to to Shakahola, where he has been having his church there with the, the uh, and uh, continue radicalizing the community members. According to Kazungu, she learned about the followers' deaths from a relative who discovered his two grandchildren dead in the church and one alive in March. The three children's parents are still missing. The community worker said her complaints about the church have been ignored, but she hopes the cult leader will be prosecuted. So I believe this time round, this thing is coming to an end. But we don't know because uh, I remember a video of him going around and telling him telling uh, the police officers that uh, like this is not in vain, something will happen to people. So you see, he's already been apprehended, but he's still threatening people. Kenya's public prosecutor, Nurdin Haji, said Monday that Mackenzie will face charges of radicalization and terrorism. Christian majority Kenya separates the state and the church in running the affairs of the country, but there is growing pressure to monitor the activities of some churches and religious leaders. Kindiki says the government must develop policies to deal with rogue churches that promote dangerous ideologies. I am now convinced beyond doubt that religious extremist, extremism is now part of the greatest five threats that we face as a country. And this opportunity, sad as it is, must help us fix and arrest the problem from ever occurring on the soil of our country ever again. The government has assured the country that Mackenzie and those who supported him will be held accountable for the deaths of his followers. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. The Committee to Protect Journalists and the Nigerian Union of Journalists have condemned the conviction of two Nigerian journalists on conspiracy and defamation charges. They were arrested and charged over an investigative report alleging that employees of Hillcrest Agro-Allied Industries in Kawara State were smoking cannabis. We have more from Abuja, Nigeria. 
A magistrate court in Ilorin recently sentenced the journalists Gidado Yushao and Alfred Olufemi to either be jailed for five months or pay $140 each for defamation and conspiracy. They originally had been arrested and charged in 2019. The two paid the fine to avoid prison. The Committee to Protect Journalists says their conviction sends a chilling message to the Nigerian press and highlights the urgent need for authorities to reform the laws and ensure journalism is not treated as a crime. Comrade Emmanuel Obweche, the chairman of the Nigeria Union of Journalists, or NUJ, tells VOA the conviction is unacceptable. The conviction of Gidado and Olufemi by the courts in Nigeria is unfortunate and speaks to the general concern about um, the safety of journalists in Nigeria. The NUJ has um, continued to make the point that defamation shouldn't be criminal in nature, rather should be a civil matter. So for the Nigerian state to continue to see defamation as a criminal matter is to empower the power elite and those that are given to non-transparency and interrogation of their dealings in the country. International human rights groups and United Nations bodies repeatedly have condemned criminal sanctions for defamation. Obeche says the matter has made journalists weary about investigative efforts. The Nigerian state hasn't really cooperated with media stakeholders in this regard in terms of ensuring that journalists are adequately protected, whether from criminal litigation or from harassment or from outright um, detention. And the statistics, like you know quite well, speak to that fact that over the course of one year, we're counting almost 10 journalists that have been killed. Musekilu Mujid is president of the Nigeria chapter of the International Press Institute. He reiterated the call for increased protection of journalists. I think it is safe to say that the safety of journalists in Nigeria is not guaranteed. There are a number of Nigerian journalists in exile, so because they do not feel safe, they are not confident that if they are here, if they do their job here, that they will be safe. He said it was sad that Nigeria's human rights body is not aiding the appeal of convictions of journalists. I am not aware that the National Human Rights Commission or Parliament or anyone else cares about some of the things that are going on. It's just some media organizations, press freedom organizations and the freedom of speech activists. Those are the ones pushing to make things better. The National Human Rights Commission does not have a history of bothering about a violation. Nigeria is ranked 120th on the World Press Freedom Index, a drop of five sports from its ranking in 2020. Press Freedom Group Reporters Without Borders described Nigeria as one of West Africa's most dangerous and difficult countries for journalists, and the situation seems to be getting worse. It attributed the drop in World Press Freedom Index rankings to reports of journalists being spied on, arbitrarily detained, attacked, and killed. For viewing news from Abuja, Nigeria. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website.